to be here and talk about color. Um, I've been a designer a long time. I didn't know there was a desperate need for paint color help originally, but I always help people with paint color all along. And uh, But in about 2009, Benjamin Moore had a pilot program in this area, and they were referring paint color consultants and painters from their website. Um, and asked me to be a part of the program. And I said, sure, I'd be happy to. I had a lot of photos of art and color. I was getting about a lead a week from that program, but the Benjamin Moore franchisees in this area, they're different businesses and they didn't like Benjamin Moore sending customers to somebody else. So they wanted to send people to the painters who bought from them or to the consultants who worked with them. And the program went away, but it opened my eyes to, to the, the need for help with paint color and <clears throat> Um, I'm a member of the International Furnishings and Design Association Washington chapter, and um, Tech Painting is a member of that, and they, I started uh, using them for my projects, and they then saw what I was doing and said, would you do paint color consultations for us? So there are other companies, and independently I do paint color consultations, but Tech Painting puts in a two-hour consultation in their um, proposals to clients and it's been mutually beneficial and that led to a member of your group who worked with me and recommended me as a speaker so I'm I'm grateful for that let me share my screen and and I've got 45 minutes of information to share and a lot of before and after photos so let me start with the first part first 15 minutes we're talking about um, basic uh, color terminology so that I can communicate better with someone about what's wrong about a color or what's right about a color. And this is something that I share with, with all my clients on um, color consultations. The, um, I have said to the group, I am happy to offer a, a paint color consultation or a design consultation to uh, sort of do a drawing of those who are on the call. If you email me after the talk, let me know something of, that was of interest and whether you would be interested in, in being invited to future webinars or speaker engagements that I have would be also nice to know. But I, if you just email me, I will put you in the hat and then I will let the group know who won the consultation, which is a $225 value. Uh, let me share the screen here, and we'll go to the first one. And here we go. Whoops, I got to back up one. Here it is. All right, so I call this Color 101 because there's some basics that not everybody knows and but is easy to learn. This isn't a mystery. It isn't that only certain people have the ability to select color. There's certain things you need to know that'll make it easier, however, and take the overwhelm out of it. So, so what do you need to know about color in order to select paint? People spend like year-long courses about color and you can teach all sorts of things about it. My focus is what do you need to know in order to select paint color for interiors and exteriors? And sometimes it affects your colors that you're selecting other things, but this is specifically focused on aspects about color related to selecting paint. So as persons, we change over time and then we have to bring our homes into alignment with who we are today. And at some point, those decisions and changes include changing paint color. Choices, however, can sometimes be overwhelming. Now, this is a photo of a Benjamin Moore store. Benjamin Moore has more paint colors than anybody else. I like that because then I can find the nuance of the hue that I'm looking for uh, or the, the, the value that promo, whatever I'm looking for in the color. Um, but we live in a land of abundant choices. There are certainly other companies. It's important to select paint from the company that your painters are going to be buying the paint from. But if you don't have a preference, I work with Benjamin Moore colors a lot because I can just, there are more colors and I can get exactly what I want. I don't have to compromise. But it can be overwhelming when you're faced with all these choices. So I found when I teach my clients the fundamentals about color and give us the same language in which to talk about color, clients select paint colors more quickly and with more confidence. 
when we use the word color in the English language, we're actually talking about three separate things with one word. Three aspects of color, three things we can change about a color to get it right. There are only three, but there are three different things. Now, the first is hue. And I'm talking basic color family names, the name of the color. Is it red? Is it blue? Is it green? What do we call it? Small crayon box, eight to 24 count, not the 152 count Ultimate Crayola collection, not this uh, colored pencil collection with all these different hues. Basic color families. Now, all of them, you can go lighter, deeper, brighter, more subdued. They keep the same basic family name except for red. And that's because as we get lighter in red, we get to pink. And, but before World War I, red was no different than the others. Pink was perceived as a light red, very aggressive. You would never put your baby girl in it. Strictly a little boy's color back then. And uh, it was just way too aggressive for little girls. Culturally, we see pink differently today, but it's sort of the exception that proves the rule when we're talking about hue. Now, another aspect about hue is warm and cool colors. But when we talk about warm and cool colors, are we talking about the emotions or the hues? Because we want people to feel that our homes are warm. We want our, our we don't want our friends cool to us. The only time cool is good is in the hot summer when we want air conditioning and to have things cool. But our eyes see fewer reds. So as what warm and cool mean in a color sense is strictly that the color leans toward yellow or it leans toward blue. And it's not talking about the emotions at all. But what I find when clients are using warm and cool, they are talking emotionally more times than not. So I try to avoid these terms because if you dislike blue, there's no such thing I mean, if you love blue, there's no such thing as a warm blue in color theory, but blue might feel warm to you. If you detest yellow, there's no such thing as a cool yellow, but yellow might feel cold if it's a color you really dislike. So these terms can be confusing, and I find it better to just set them aside. The second aspect of color, that was hue. The second aspect of color is the value, and that has to do with where does the color stand between white and black? And it doesn't have to be strictly in grayscale. It applies to colors as well. And in low light conditions, we see the value of the color before we see the hue. Now, if you have a family member with color perception issues, which we call color blindness, value distinctions in your home are going to be a lot more important to them. They don't see the nuances of hue, so they're going to definitely want contrast with the trim. They may want the color on the wall deeper, whereas you were thinking light and airy, but you need to understand they do see color, they see it differently, and colors can clash for them as well, so do get them in the conversation. They're aware that they don't see color like everybody else, but that doesn't mean that their opinion isn't a factor in the selections. And I've had family members who say, oh, now I understand why you want stronger colors, because you want the contrast. Now think about going to that harborside restaurant. You're sitting at the table, you're looking over the railing at the moving water, or you're standing on a dock looking at the moving water. The water goes lighter, deeper, in between. It's all the different values of the watercolor which are mesmerizing. You can watch that water for hours. In the same way, an interior use of color, if you vary the values of color as you travel from the entry, the hallway, to the destination spaces, into the powder room and out, you set up pleasurable rhythmic changes in your home. And so I always encourage value changes. If someone talks to me, well, I was just going to do the same color on the whole first floor. Think about this. You may have less light in the hallway and may want it lighter, and but you may want a deeper color or more contrast in another room. In exteriors, homes are marketed in black and white as well as a color, although now they're doing video marketing and all sorts of things. But there is a small percentage of marketing on a home that's in black and white. So the value and contrast of the color selections is important as well. So in this house, they wanted a, a medium blue 
They had white trim on the windows and the window frames. The black shutters gave us nice contrast. The front door in this case is a similar value to the house, but it's a different hue. It's green because their heritage, uh, they had ancestors from Ireland and they wanted a green front door, but it all worked out very well. Now, as we get <clears throat> go from light to deep, and I'm going to talk about light and deep rather than dark, because dark is a feeling and I don't know where your dark is. So I have a client from Scandinavia. Hopefully you can see the little arrow on my screen. Uh, she had white trim and she hit dark right here. She grew up in a house in a country with light, no light, six months of the year. And this felt terribly dark to her. This the next step, you know, like a slight cream or off white. And we could only find colors between the two for her walls because it was way too dark to be here. And yet I have some millennials for whom it's black is not dark. It doesn't feel dark to them. It's their color and uh, they're perfectly comfortable with it. Um, so just be aware. If you tell me a color feels dark, then I know you're getting tight in the chest. You're not comfortable we can lighten it up either by putting something light on top of it because we still want the contrast or we can go to a lighter value of the color. Now the third aspect of color, we have hue, we have value, now we're into chroma. And chroma is how much gray is in a color. So you see these colors on the, the, the fan deck are all the really bright versions of the colors that every six to 12 year old wants in their room. Their eyes handle glare better than even a 20 year old. And it's stimulating for the brain to have the bright colors around. That's why you have bright colors in Fisher-Price toys and other children's toys and educational materials. But we can take this electric lime and add gray to it, make it a soothing sage. And it's not as high energy. It's more relaxing. And you can continue to add gray to it and get an earthy color. But if you keep adding gray at some point, it may hit sad and dreary. This may be cold water in your face up here at the top and the middle might work, but if it's a party space, we may need to up the chroma. If it's a space you sleep in, you may want to lower the chroma. So that is a, sort of the direction and what happens with chroma. But why? What is it about gray that makes it that which changes chroma instead of being a hue? Because we certainly have gray paint colors and gray crayons, and we've got hue differences within gray paint. So what's going on? Well, when you look at phone, uh, look at color on your laptop, on your computer monitor, on your phone, your look on your TV, you're looking at color carried by light. It's RGB color, which is a setting on your monitor, color carried by light. That means red, green, blue forms white light. And then when you have the white light, you break it apart, you get the rainbow. But you saw something, a color online, it looked interesting. Maybe you weren't thinking about it for paint color and you go and print it up out of your printer. It comes out of the printer wonky every time. It might have the information, the color number, but it's, it's not coming out the same as it looked online. Well, that's because the printer's using CMYK, cyan, magenta, yellow, black, color carried by ink. Entirely different combination than red, green, blue. And this isn't even red here, it's magenta. Then you go to the store, you pull the color chip and it doesn't look the same either. And maybe you didn't print it up. Maybe you just got it in your phone and you're looking at it, but it still doesn't look the same. And that's because paint is not formed by red, green, blue. Paint is formed by red, yellow, blue, which are the primary colors they teach us in elementary school because they're teaching us about color with paint, not with light. Few elementary schools are starting to do RGB color, I mean, the, the, in, in teaching about color as well. But this is where everybody starts. Red, yellow, blue are the primary colors in paint. And we're gonna come back to that. Fundamentally, all colors are in gray, but some grays show more blue than anything else, like that basic blue-gray crayon called gray. So here it is. That's where we get our reference of what gray is from the time we were little. And I, I keep this as a reference. Now, here are some Benjamin Moore blue grays. If, um, 
you know, this is of interest. You can use your phone and take a picture of it. You can come back to the presentation and capture these. I'm not going to spend a long time here, but I put together some blue grays. Some grays are greener grays. They show more blue and yellow than red. Blue plus yellow is green. Gray owl, when gray was rediscovered, gray owl was asked for day in and day out. And what happened is we got toked to death. And taupe is essentially red plus yellow. It makes brown. And if you go lighter, you're in cream, darker, you're in brown, but you cannot vary it as much. And people, some people were saying, what can I do that's a neutral, it's not taupe. I'm being brown to death. And one taupe house or taupe room looks pretty much like another. It might lean a little toward tan or lean a little toward the red side, um, but that's about all you can do with taupe. But when you add that little bit of blue in it, to make it, so you have blue, yellow, and red, then you get the full spectrum of color in grays. So what you have here are three different values of a similar gray, gray owl, Stonington, and Coventry gray, um, but they are all greener grays. Kendall charcoal is another one that you may have heard of. It's a, it's a greener gray. Some grays are browner grays, so these have more red and yellow and the red and yellow makes brown. And again, here's the value differences of four different browner grays, classic gray, edgecomb gray. And people look at that and it's, it's an interesting sort of modern brown. They say, well, that's not what I thought was gray. Yeah, because it's not anything like your blue gray crayon, but it's still called gray because it has all colors in it. And then Ash and Tan and Baja Dunes are, are great workhorses in a browner gray. Some grays are earthy purple grays. Now that means they've got more red and blue than yellow, even if they don't read as purple. And some do, some don't. So elephant gray down here has more of a purple cast than these three, which are the most neutral of the purple grays Benjamin Moore has. Barren Plain is a little more blue than Abalone, which has a little more red, but they both have a balance of blue and red more than yellow. And Silver Fox is the parent of Abalone. It's a little deeper value. And some grays are very balanced grays. So like smoke embers is pretty much here in the middle. It's got a balance of, and it goes with everything. Nimbus is a lighter value of smoke embers. And there's some that seem to defy being categories. These are two from the Williamsburg collection, Bruton White and Bone Black. They're very interesting grays. They're sort of brown, but you put them next to a brown gray, they don't look brown. They're not green, you know, what are they? But they're very interesting grays that sometimes are a really good fit. But Linda, I don't want a gray paint color. Well, that's fine too, but you need to know every little chroma color has all colors in it too. And, you know, I've had people say, well, I want a gray, but I don't want any colors. I mean, I don't want any colors with any yellow in it, but I, I, I don't want them too bright. Well, then they're all going to have some yellow lurking in them somewhere because they're lower chroma. They have gray in them. Now this is where paint color selection gets complicated because color reacts to color and what's in a color affects how it reacts to other colors. So this little diagram that I found is really good. So hue is going around the color wheel, all the different color families. Chroma is like taking your dimmer switch and you're going high, brighter and dimmer in terms of intensity and the electricity of the color. Value is you're moving toward white or you're moving toward black within the color. Um, so it gets lighter and deeper. But what needs to be adjusted in the color to get it right? If you look at these three different things, you may find that you're very close with what you selected, but you've got to adjust one of these. So if the color seems too dark or deep or too washed out, you need to adjust the value of the color. If the color is too bright, like it's cold water in your face or sad and dreary, you need to adjust the chroma. And especially rooms where you're going into them when you first wake up or you're going in them to sleep. Like if someone's picking colors for their kitchen, don't pick it late in the afternoon. Make sure that you can face that color first thing in the morning when you're just waking up, especially if you're a night owl like me. Or if you're a morning person, Maybe you need to make sure that the color in your bedroom you can face late at night when you're, when you're not at your best and you're trying to wind down. And if the color just seems off, if it clashes with another color or reacts too strongly, consider a different hue. And sometimes you need to adjust all three. 
So how do I sample paint color effectively? This is not it. <laughs> the throwing on the wall choice. But in order to answer that question, you need to understand a little better that all color affects color. Now, these are actually the exact same gray glued onto a poster board that I took photos of. Now, the photography made a little bit of a difference. These are closer in real life than they show in this picture. But you can flip these and this one will still be bluer and deeper and this one will still be lighter and a little grayer, uh, greener um, when you change them from one to the other. I glued these samples on myself onto the poster board and I have a set that I use in color consultations and I show people both of these chips that have the exact same writing on them, they're exactly the same. And you put them down and they match and then you flip them. And the one, when I move this over here, it becomes just like this one. When I move this one over here, it becomes just like this one. The color is affected by the background. And that's what happens if you have that helpful painter who's painting the swatches on the color that you don't like anymore and you want it to go away and they're painting the new colors on it or they're painting them side by side they are reacting to each other making it more difficult to discern whether it's the correct color you're just making it harder on yourself to do it that way i do not recommend doing that the most effective way to sample paint is to create sample boards. And what you need to use is foam core board. Now, Vienna Paint calls these mighty boards. Um, many paint stores have smaller sizes of these. There's that styrofoam sandwich of foam core board. The, I mean, the mighty boards are a little different. They're plasticine, but they have foam core board pieces also. And either one, they, they, they do better. They reflect light the way drywall and plaster do. Poster board soaks up some of the paint and can change the colors. So I don't recommend doing it on poster board. Um, so you want to paint the sample all the way off the edges of the poster board so no whiteboard is showing and paint two coats. And keep the sample away from the colors that are going away. So how do you do this? If you or your trim color is not changing, you can take that doorway opening and put your sample board right up against the frame and see how it's going to be with the trim color without having it on the wall. If you, you can put it in the middle of a painting to see if it gets along with the painting. You can put it on the upholstery to see what it's gonna look like behind the upholstery if the sofa is against the wall. But you keep it 12 to 18 inches away so that you can see the color on the sample board and not have it overly influenced by what's on the wall. You do want to put the colors you're considering next to the tile, countertops, flooring. If you're remodeling, you know, samples that you're changing, other future partners, you can put it next to your floors or your carpeting, your oriental rugs if they're staying. All of the things that are staying in a room, you can put that sample board near. Now, all color is also affected by light. Without light, we have no color. And we think we're selecting a color, but we're actually selecting a range of color. You can see here, because of light, it's lighter here, it's deeper here. So when you have your sample board, you want to look at your colors on the light wall opposite the window and on the darkest wall. Can you see how it's deeper down here and up here than it is over here? That light is coming in past the wall, not on the wall, and your colors are going to be different here. It's something we don't pay attention to every day, but when you go to select paint, you don't want to only look at it on the light wall and then discover it got too deep on the deeper, darker wall. You don't want to only look at it on the deeper wall and discover it got too washed out. Now, the other thing to know about color <clears throat> is colors are friends of their neighbors. They're lovers of their opposites. So red and green is a holiday combination for Christians. It's a way to, because the colors fire each other up and they're a great home decor combination as well. Amari porcelain is navy blue and russet because blue and orange are opposites. They fire each other up. They make a wonderful color combination. Purple and yellow are always a great combination. Yes, purple and blue, I mean, yellow and blue are a classic combination, but you get more energy with purple and yellow. Um, and so how does this impact as far as, you know, what do you, why do you need to know this? You use this knowledge to prevent problems. 
So if I'm working with a client and they have beautiful cherry cabinets, they love the richness of it, but they don't want them to look more orange, we're not going to use a blue in that kitchen because whether it's maple cabinets or cherry cabinets, the blue is gonna make that, that cabinetry look more orange or it might be a table that we don't want to have look more orange. If we have pickled cabinetry in a kitchen, for instance, that, that with that pink blush, you don't want to use a green with it if you don't want to, those cabinets to look more pink um, because they're opposites. Um, there are colors point out their similarities far apart. They point out their differences next to each other. And um, when you put things next to each other, if you're not sure what's in a color, you can challenge it with another color so you can see the differences. Also, you can tell the differences between whites if you're looking at them on a white background. You can tell the differences between blacks and really deep colors better if you're looking at them on a black background. Now, the next part of the presentation is gonna be before and after examples focused on exterior um, color applications, uh, color harmonies for your home. And um, <clears throat> that um, I did want to mention right here in case anybody has to leave the call earlier, you can find over 31 reviews of my work and many of them talk about my color work. Um, look for Masterworks Window Fashions and Design LLC on house.com. Um, I have a business profile. It also has my most recent photos there. You can see my award-winning projects, including the ones I did at Anderson House for the uh, Society of Cincinnati and the Revolutionary War Institute. Um, but I don't have them as a part of the presentation today. The other thing, just while we're here in the middle to mention that I am inviting people to put their names in the hat for a complimentary color consultation or design consultation. It's a $225 value. And uh, what you all you have to do is email me at LHB, that's Lima Hotel Bravo, at masterworksdesign.com. I'd love to know something that was a takeaway from the presentation. You let me know that you'd like to be in the drawing. And uh, also let me know if you'd like to be invited to future webinars or in-person speaker presentations. That would, um, because then I can let you know. Um, so I'm going to stop this share and go quickly to my other presentation, which is here. And from the beginning. Come on. Okay. All right. So <clears throat> given that you're a Capitol Hill Restoration Society, I have a lot of clients who have different concerns about the exterior home than the interior, that they might be a little more adventuresome on the interior. Know that I was sent an article about uh, the brick and the dark windows and the, you know the the historic nature of a home is which you're not painting the brick. I'm working with clients who've already made a decision to paint, and I'm trying to help them get the paint colors right, or they may have the house painted and it needs to be repainted. Um, so I'm going to set aside the issue of whether you should paint or not separately for the most part. But the point of doing this in the before and after photos is to talk about hue context where you're actually selecting colors. Here's that little chart again. So this first one, I'm sorry that on my um, screen, this little bit about the participants and stuff is hiding some of it. But basically there was a house, uh, um, a, a street in which a, a utility company dug a big hole in the middle of the street. And then they brought in a pile driver to compact what they were filling in with the result that it damaged all the homes on the street. Houses had to be re-tuck pointed. There was one house that had a big crack in the foundation. The houses had cracks inside the walls. This is a house that had had all new tuck pointing after that disaster. And I actually helped uh, so far four different clients with their exterior color on the street. So they had had the gray before, but the white is all new tuck pointing. Uh, they're getting new windows. Uh, the only thing that they said is we love our front door color. 
So let's have that as a starting point. And we want to bring that red somewhere else into what we do. And they ended up going with this green. Um, the uh, creaminess of the trim was in relationship, green is blue plus yellow and a creamy trim works really well with green. Um, you can see there's nothing, I'll show you in the next picture. Um, analyzing, before we pick colors, I have to analyze the architecture, what's going on. So these houses had this foundation detail that most of them had painted a contrast color. They also had these lovely meters right at the front of their house. And this one house, unlike all the others, in this space between the front steps and the, the bend of the front of the house, where there's a, a, a basically a bay, um, they had put in this concrete block and the, the uh, homeowners had put the urn there. There's a similar color to sort of minimize the attention getting aspect of this block. But I felt we could do something better. Um, over the windows and doors, there was this arch brick and keystones and there was no contrast there. And then up in the cornice, they have these indentations on this street. Many of the, the houses uh, have the indentations here. You can see a little better and they've got this stepping. And so there were some details that we could highlight and there were a number of ways we could do it. So I have some software where I can do a rendering actually on a photograph. So I take the photograph and then I can draw on it and put in colors if needed. I don't do this for every color consultation, but this was to show them, we talked about doing a two-tone effect with the keystone and the arch. And I just put in a color for the window since that isn't decided yet. And this, of the choices I sent them, I sent them four or five. This is the one they selected. And here you have the completed version of it. And then I'll be getting back together with them um, once the new windows are in place. Now, reducing contrast is a good thing for chameleons and also for distractions from the architecture. So if we go back to where we were with the meters and this concrete block, it now disappears. This is a slightly different green than above, slightly deeper, uh, but we've reduced the contrast and had the meters the same color as what's behind them and the concrete block the same, which allows the beautiful veining and everything in their front steps to stand out and the urn to stand out and this architectural lovely of the concrete just disappears. Now sometimes I have a client who just wants to paint the brick in a brick color. One of the jobs I went to, we actually they actually only painted the brick and left the mortar unpainted. But this client had had the house in a red, which he thought was a brick color, and I felt it was way too bright. We came up with a, a good color uh, to change it to. This is one of the houses, again, new tuck pointing and damage uh, dealt with. In this case, we added a deeper foundation color. And again, the meter's the same color as the foundation. This color was found in the veining in these marble steps. So that's where that color came from. There, his windows were vinyl, they were not being painted, and he wanted a white trim. But the trim he had before was a blue white, which didn't do well with this earthy red. And so we went to a much creamier white for the trim. And for the and we didn't do two colors. It's just one color. But this color is a little closer to the white. It's a little creamier, um, where it doesn't have the bright sun on it. That's truer to what we actually selected. Now, once you natural brick has a certain amount of water repellency inherent to it, but once it's painted, you lose that. And this is something that my brother taught me when he was still in architecture school. And so once that brick is painted, it needs to continue to be painted for the, the keeping the water out of the house, unless you're gonna put, take the paint off and put a water repellent sealant of some sort on it. In this case, the colors are only a slight change except at the foundation, but the client was very happy. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about white when used for exteriors. White, Outside, there's a lot of glare, and so all your exterior colors need to be a little more blackened compared to what you would do inside. 
And so your whites are different too. Uh, the whitest white Benjamin Moore has is Chantilly Lace. Sherwin Williams has high reflective white. Neither of them are the best whites for exterior use. Super white is another one that's harsh and glary when you use it outside. This particular one was done in snowfall white, which is white with a drop of cream in it and worked well with this off-white that they selected. Um, there are, here are some other good whites for exterior use. If you have more like blue, gray, white windows, distant gray is whiter than the Benjamin Moore color called white, whiter than ceiling white. Um, and I'm going to set aside for just a minute this slide and just talk about ceiling white because if I can save one of you from ceiling white, I consider it a good day. Ceiling white goes back to when these paint companies that were around a long time only had one white paint color. And it was when harsh lye-based detergents were yellowing clothes and people put bluing in the laundry to make the whites not look dingy. Our grandmothers did this, or great-grandmothers, depending on your age. But you, the, 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 everybody knew white had blue in it. They put blue in it. So if you had one paint, it had to be a blue-white paint. But today we have a lot more whites and the color white is a blue gray white. Super white is a slightly higher reflected version of it. Distant gray is a well-behaved one because it has a little bit of gray in it, but it's whiter than the color called white. Ignore the name, it's whiter. And it makes a great exterior white if you're in a blue gray white. Uh, you know, if you're in a blue or white. Pure white in Sherwin-Williams is it also a blue or white. Steam is white with a drop of brown in it. White Dove is white with a drop of yellow and a little bit of gray. Snowfall white has just a little bit of creaminess in it. Capital white and West Highland white are very creamy, but very good, well-behaved exterior whites if you want a creamy white. And your wrought iron on Capitol Hill, you're going to be using Benjamin Moore black or Sherwin Williams tricorn black most of the time to get that great crisp black that everybody has there. Other uses, Benjamin Moore onyx is a great exterior black. Mop board black is a little gray, so if someone doesn't want it quite as crisp, that's a, a, a nice black to use as well. Now color needs balance. So here are two neighbors. Again, I worked with both of these clients, both uh, on the street with the disaster. This client went to grays, but went deeper on the trim. Again, just the keystone and the arch are the same, but these are almost like opposites. You've got a deeper house here with lighter trim and a lighter house here with deeper trim. The colors get along and, um, you know, it's just a great impact. And so, um, and they both have a, a slightly deeper value down here at the foundation brick, which visually supports things better than, than painting white down there. Now, this is not a Capitol Hill house. This is a mo mid-century modern house in Tacoma Park, but it illustrates the changing the value, and in this case, also the hue, but your the value is the key thing to lower contrast. Now this, they consider the front of the house and it, you have to ignore this addition that they put on their fence to keep the dog in. But we have brick back here and we wanted the color of the house to blend with the brick. The art, the house is actually owned by an artist and her husband. And when they first moved in, we, they went with this cheery red, but over time they realized, you know, this is not blending into the natural landscape and it's not doing a whole lot with the brick. And so what we wanted to do was reduce contrast after, uh, after a conversation with them. They agreed that would be a good thing. And instead of all these windows being white, you see now we've got, we have a part of the window we, they didn't want to paint, but the rest of it is deeper and less contrast so that the, the house is an organic hole. On the front, this is before and after. So you can see how this siding is lower here on one side of the door where you go in. And this is the, the main entrance and it's shorter. And the contrast color just really caused you to see all these odd shapes. The white is distracting and you lose some of the shape of the window because the underside soffit here is, is white. 
And then over here, we've got this monolith of a big white shed that has no relationship to anything else except for this one red line that they had put in. I did not work with them with the first previous colors. Now, as the crew was finishing up, she sent me some photos and we had decided to make the shed in the same colors that blend with the brick and to highlight the detailing on here. And these are all the raised boards that are brown. But in the fine print of my write-up, I had said, we need to do these boards as well so that it's the true barn door effect. And so I said, we don't want an asterisk there and all this geometry going on. Have them paint the boards that they missed. And they went back and, and this is the completed job. The other thing when she sent me, this is the before photo, she sent me this picture and you see how the soffit is now just an organic shape and this house is all about shapes being more modern architecture. It's blending in with the brick, not a separate piece and what do I look at first, but this downspout is still drawing way too much attention. So now the downspout is just again painted in to just disappear. So I was grateful she sent me those photos and we didn't have to send the crew back. They were still on site. Now this is a house where I didn't get the before photos until it, you know dark had hit, but the house had white fencing. It was a white on white house. It was a big white monolith on the street and they wanted more contrast. They wanted it more distinctive. It just, they had done a contrast up in the fish scales, but nothing else what had much contrast. And then we had all this color in the, the stonework that was in the steps. So you can see the oranges here in the stone that inspired the front door color. And now we have a lot more contrast here. These fish scale shingles are a light gray, a little deeper than the window trim. So we didn't lose this arch into the fish scales, but you still also see the fish scales nicely against the siding. And that applies with older homes as well. Here's the side of the house. You can see more of the stone and that color that's on the front door is around the garage door. But the, the white railing on this deck and the fish scales and everything um, work well. And here it is for the house. And now we have the contrast with the fencing, the handrails, with the balconies, with the windows. And they were a lot happier with the house. Now here's a case where we were changing the chroma and the value. This is the before photo over here. And the clients felt that this house was somber and dreary. And they said, it doesn't feel like Capitol Hill. It feels like they're trying to make it a Victorian painted lady. And this isn't, doesn't make a lot of sense with what we see with our neighbors and around on Capitol Hill. So they wanted to change it. Also these yellow tones we're pulling out yellow out of the stone. The stone's not as yellow as this paint color. And when I looked at it and I looked at all that detail, I said, wait a minute, why didn't they bring out the detail that's here on the bottom? And why didn't they bring out the detail at the top of this window? And why did they paint away the detail up in the top? So since they wanted it lighter and airier, and now this blue is not as bright as it shows, but again, it's high resolution of photography on a very bright day. Um, this is a, a, a more well-behaved blue than the photograph shows. Um, the the uh, door is certainly a deeper, richer, more royal blue. But we picked up lighter tones in the stone to get this soft brown gray for this um, bump out on the, the double window on the second floor. And since they wanted fewer colors, I said, well, there's a lot of wrought iron on Capitol Hill, but what if we use white wrought iron as an inspiration and get the laciness of all this detail, um, like plaster work and wrought iron um, in the contrast of the white. And then we picked up the white at the top of the window and then used this color that's on the window in this little curvy X up here. So here's a close up. Again, you can see all this lovely detail work is easier to see uh, with fewer colors and uh, very clean. And it gets along well with this neighbor and this neighbor that was dark red and a house was in bad shape and needed painting. Once these two were in place, they went and painted lighter colors there as well. Um, this is showing the upper contrast 
again on the third story. So here's a, a house where we changed the chroma by raising the chroma to brighter colors, not for the stucco. Now you need to understand there are photographic differences here and seasonal differences. This is a house in Northeast Washington, DC in a neighborhood with a lot of houses that are Victorian houses with multicolor paint schemes. This stucco color and this stucco color are actually the same, but this was taken in winter with glare into my phone. And this was taken with high resolution photography on a sunny day in late spring. So there's there are color differences that occur because of that. But at the same time, there are definitely differences that we made. And because brown and yellow have a different relationship than purple and yellow, the yellow gets brighter over here also partly because the window trim is now purple. So the door was black, but we took this outer door frame and detailed it in the same purple of the trim. So this is a before. And before there was this sort of olive drab color on the railings. And they did a little bit of detail on the railing, but it's mostly this olive drab. Now we've got a multicolor scheme, a blue or green. The purple that's in the trim around the windows is here. And we've got the purple here and then reds here uh, with the green. Now, when you look at the fish scales on this house, you can't see the scalloping because they painted the cedar shakes below it the same color. So by using the contrast color that I had on the balcony under the fish scales, now you see all those scallops. This is a more is more house, not a less is more house. They have all these details and they have this wonderful red color in the tiles. So we bring out the reds in detailing near the roof line that sing with the tile. And instead of all this being a monolith of brown and brown and brown, we have these gold colors with the red colors, with the purple, with the greens, a multicolor house. It's a complex color scheme. It's not for everyone, but in this neighborhood, it makes sense and they are not an outlier. Here's a kitchen door and back porch brought into colors. And again, showing more details on the, uh, porch brought out. And the, they had a basement apartment that they wanted to turn into an Airbnb. So this needed to be perked up as well, as opposed to the forgotten door down here. This is showing more. It's the same color stucco. We, they didn't paint the stucco, but you now have the purple trim instead of the brown trim. And this is the side of the house with the upper deck railing that was brought into the color scheme and the side of the house. So now that the house is cheerier and brought into this more complex color scheme, the next phase is they're working on the landscaping in the side yard. But um, I guess uh, one of the early before, they, there used to be just like pipes here and they actually put in nicer handrails on these front steps as a part of this project as well. And this was another one that Tech Painting sent me to. And one of the things about Tech Painting is they will, they have, they work with, with carpenters to deal with homeowner repairs if parts of the uh, siding or the woodwork uh, uh, need repair. And so you don't have to bring in a different contractor. They can do it all in house, which I appreciate when I've got clients who, who need the repair. So sometimes, again, hue, value, and chroma, sometimes um, changes are made to all three. So this is a before and after. There's still a blue house, but we got a lower chroma blue over here. So we lowered the chroma, kept it blue, but wanted a more well-behaved. Uh, this client um, told me she never really liked the blue. Once she got it, it was always a little too bright. And she's a part of a row of historic houses that are much photographed. And uh, so that was the first thing to pick the main blue color. Again, analyzing the architectural details, all these wonderful corbels uh, on the soffit under the roof line and these wonderful cornices over the windows. Well, I wanted these corbels to stand out so what we did is put a contrast color in here. Now this is a chart where I've drawn on the 
photograph. The colors aren't in place yet, but this is showing the paint company where the colors are going and what they are. And this um, is what I sent to them. And so here's an after photo. Do you see the little deeper color in here? This is the etiquette color that's been painted. And it's not as deep as this, really. It's just in shadow, but it's lighter like this. Just a subtle contrast, but it makes the corbels stand out. And uh, doesn't cost you any more in paint to just pick a different color there. This is, again, before and after. They, she did do new stain on the door. But the big difference here is there's this wooden step after the first marble step, and it was in a blue-gray. Now we have it in a different hue so that it's tying into the flagstone. This color is, was picked specifically to work with the flagstone. So you also have situations where you very much have to factor in choices the neighbors have already made. These are three houses um, in, uh, on Capitol Hill. And the first one, this client painted, this person, not my client, painted this house teal with the white and the chocolate brown and sold the house and moved away. And then these two people said, now what do we do? <laughs> so I was brought in to help both the clients. They were getting a break on the painting because they were doing it at the same time. And the first client that I worked with was over in the house on the right. She knew what she wanted and she wanted the house. She loved the white of the Oriel bow and she wanted the, the whole house to be whiter. But when the whole house goes white, these lintels would disappear if we didn't have another color for that. She knew she wanted this green to be combined with the white we found a gray green to work with it to just be a stone color for the lintels, which makes sense. And then because she doesn't have all the appliques that her two neighbors does, a few are missing, she did not want these in contrast. So we just did a whole band of green here, band of green here, and the contrast white between, and then the green is here and on these little medallions. So it's complicated to write up, but um, and it and it took a while to figure out. And then down here, she's got a little medallion, which we also did in the green in the bottom of the shell. Here's another close-up showing some of the details. <clears throat> now we're at the middle house. She knows this house is going white and she's got this neighbor who's in teal. Now what do we do? And we looked at a number of combinations. They wanted to change the front door color as well. This house, unlike the other two, has a lower level patio with basement entrance from the front. And then for some unknown reason, this one dark brick windowsill on the whole house, which didn't make sense to me. So what did we do? This is the after. So now we have a balance of values. You've got light, medium, and deeper. Um, this gray is different from the gray up here. It's a little more purple gray because we're pairing it with a yellow to get more contrast. It doesn't look purple. It's just in that family. And down here, that dark red brick sill is now just disappeared into what everything else has with the white. We brought out these bands of color, which um, the neighbor just kept them white, but it was a detail that she, this client and her husband like to bring out. And that is, and so now here's all three houses. And uh, they picked the coral door, which works well with the yellow as well. So here's on the same street, another house, the before and after. This house definitely needed to be repainted, but there were some other weird things. Do you see how it's navy blue top and bottom on this part of the railing and it's all white here? So we made them all the same. We picked a brighter color, not as somber as this navy blue, not as heavy, uh, but still with the strength to contrast to the lighter blue. But again, because of the neighbors being light, a deeper value than they had. This was a very, very pale light blue that read almost as a blue gray and didn't give as much contrast to the neighbors. So a little more contrast here. And then up here, you see in this picture, 
the detailing, whereas before this was all in the, the navy blue, now there's detail in this triangle and you can see these same appliques that are on those three houses that we just saw down the street. So it brings it into the music of the street. This was another house with change inspired by the neighbor's choice. Their neighbor had painted their house in mustard and these clients said, you know, we need more color. We just need to do something different. And this is what we did. So with the neighbor in, in this mustard yellow, now we have a, a sagey green that works with their beautiful gardens, the front and back. They liked the contrast of the red with the green, which is again opposite. Um, let me go to the previous one just to show you. They had um, an, a step here that was just the same color as the siding, all gray. And it, it wasn't a part of these steps. So that got painted more the brick color to make the steps go all the way up to the little um, uh, porch with the portico. And a purple accent color pairs up with the gold and was used. It's an earthy purple, a low chroma purple, but the purple was used here because they wanted something else in terms of color. And that's how that house turned out. Now this is one where the exterior color inspired by the colors in the stone. Here's the flagstone that has blues and grays. And here's the house. Now this customer actually had done a teardown of her house and had this new house built and to finance that in part, she sold the not lot next door and the same architect built another house next door and I was brought in. This is a, where I drew on a photograph just to name all the different parts so that they corresponded to the spreadsheet that I was writing about which color went where. And here's the completed house for this one. Uh, this color on the steps is a little bit different than the color here. But this color, this color in, in the columns and up there and here is all the same. And the trim work here is the same as on the gables uh, on these boards. So to summarize, hue, value, and chroma, those are the only three things you can change about a color, but there are three things you're changing about a color to get it just right. I wanted to thank Patricia Mullenby for recommending me as a speaker to the group. I very much appreciate the opportunity to share this information with you all. And I wanted to convey a thank you also to Tech Painting. All but the last two were projects of theirs that they sent me. Um, and, um, you know, as I say, their, their client proposals all include two hours of paint color consultation with me. I do do work directly with clients and I do do work with other painting companies, but these ones in Washington, D.C., generally are always tech painting. So if you get overwhelmed, keep in mind there's someone you can call. I am fully vaccinated and boosted. I am mastering appointments as clients prefer as current guidelines warrant. Um, I do do other things besides paint color consultation. Um, I'm, uh, I have a specialty, I'm a certified window treatment consultant and a window fashion certified professional. That's why it's Masterworks Window Fashions and Design. I'm a five-time winner at the International Window Coverings Expo and Design Competition. Um, and I've invented some window treatments. I work with people on reupholstery, art, and color. So color harmonies for your home, artistry at your windows, those are two of my specialties. And your story is my inspiration. I don't believe in inflicting a Linda Bassett look. My signature is my collaborative approach and to get it right for you because it's your home. And I would say, please look for Masterworks Window Fashions and Design LLC on house.com. You're going to find over 31 testimonials and my most current project proposals. Here's my email right here. If you email me, I'll put you in the drawing for a a free color or design consult initial consultation, which is up to two hours. Um, and uh, it's a $225 value that I will offer to those of you who have been on the call. And I would love to hear a takeaway that you got, or if you have questions now, I'm open for questions. Thank you so much, Linda. Um, 
If anybody has questions, feel, please feel free to uh, take yourself off mute and uh, go ahead and ask them. I don't think we had any questions in the chat. So. Well, there was somebody, excuse me, there's somebody in there uh, who said, can we have a dissertation on ceiling colors and how color won't just make the room darker at the end of the talk? That's that I'd be happy to talk about ceiling colors. Let me stop the share and be a, have a, a little more direct communication with you. So one of the things that you need to keep in mind is whether you have crown molding. I see over there on B. Larkin's iPad behind you, you have crown molding. Well, where, if you have the ceiling color and the crown the same, and there's no contrast at the top of your crown, your crown molding actually lowers your ceiling. The only contrast point is at the bottom of your crown. Now you seem to have some contrast. I'm not pointing you out as a bad example. I'm trying to just use it as an illustration. If you have a room with crown molding, your crown could be deeper, it could be lighter, but if it's lighter, you want your ceiling to be a slightly deeper value than your crown so that the contrast is up at the top of the crown and your eye goes to the crown the top of the crown to get all the height in the room because people don't put crown molding in to lower their ceilings. But when they use paint color incorrectly, then that's exactly what they're doing. Now, I'm not a fan of ceiling white because it's a dreary blue-gray white, it's a cloudy day on your room, and painters will just say, oh, we're going to do ceiling white. Well, well you know, once upon a time, there was only one choice and painters many times have the mindset of, let's just push you to pick your colors so that I can get the job done and get paid. But ceiling white is not doing you any favors unless you have a blue gray room. If it's a blue gray room, it's a wonderful color or you can use decorators white, but ceiling white is the, is the Benjamin Moore colored white or it's the equivalent in Sherwin Williams or other companies. Um, it's a basic blue-gray white. And many people are not doing their rooms in blue-gray and there are better ceiling colors. So, and it depends on whether you're doing crown or not. So you could take, if you have white trim, you could do the same white that's your trim for the ceiling if you don't have crown molding. But if you have crown molding, let's pick a slightly different color for your, your ceilings. Now there is going to be a finish difference because your trim is done in semi-glossers or um, you might have a, a slightly less um, less sheen in something like Benjamin Moore satin finish. Um, in Sherwin-Williams satin is the same as eggshell but in Benjamin Moore satin is a slightly lower sheen trim paint. But your ceilings are always going to be in a flat paint. If it's Benjamin Moore it's an ultra flat um, and you know when I was a little girl, there was only choices of flat for the ceiling, eggshell for the walls, semi-gloss with trim. That's all the choices you have. But today we have the matte finish, which is a washable flat. And so many, many people are going to the washable flats for their interior walls because they uh, it's more touch upable. Eggshell, if you go to if you have a nick and you want to touch up a spot, you have to paint the whole wall. But as far as what you choose on the ceiling color, it depends on the colors in the room. And I'm looking at, okay, what are our partners? Do we need to be a little creamier, a little grayer? Do you want atrium white, which is white with a drop of pink that makes everybody's complexion look good if you're fair skin? Um, that's a great ceiling color. There are other ceiling colors that you can use, but don't just let a painter push you into ceiling white because it says ceiling white, because you can get ceiling paint in any color with most of these companies. Did that answer the questions? No response. <laughs> well, I guess so. How about um, one more question? Because we are running a little bit late, but that's not a problem. Patricia, you missed the part where I was talking about your house. I'm sorry. No, I didn't miss that. I oh, saw, you did? I, yeah, I was here. Oh, good. Okay. 
So if we don't have questions, I thank you very much for the opportunity to share some of this with you all. Um, and um, I, I'd love to hear from you if there was something that was particularly beneficial in the talk. Uh, it's valuable for me as I you know, tweak it for the next time I give some of this presentation. I did it in two parts because the color one-on-one part, which is what I often, if someone hasn't been on this presentation, that's what I'm going to go over with them before we start picking colors so that we can communicate better so they can tell me what's wrong about a color I'm showing them because I want to get it right for you. And it's, but at the same time, I'm also looking, you know, if you're, if you have a Jap Japanese woodcut um, print, you're going to need lower chroma colors than if you have modern graphic art. And, you know, I'm looking at what you have and where you've been and what you love and what you tell me is wrong about what you have now. And then we'll get to the right colors. And I, because colors affected by light and things can happen, I do have also, if I do paint colors for someone and there's one color that just for some reason is not quite right, I'll come out one more time at, at no charge to tweak that one color. Um, I've had a, I had a situation in my own home. I went to paint an office, a different office than the one I'm in now, but a, 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 my mother was a photographer and I said, she has this wonderful photo of cherry blossoms in the rain. And I want that cherry blossom pink for the walls in this room. And I went to a Benjamin Moore dealer to pick up the can of paint with the color I thought was perfect. And they slapped a label on it, highly reflective paint. <laughs> but huh, I've never seen this on a piece of can of paint I bought, brought it home. Now the paints have all been reformulated, so this doesn't exist anymore. But that particular one had this label on it. I brought it home, I painted it. Well, what happened is in the corners where it bounced on itself, it went from soft cherry blossom pink to Pepto-Bismol. And I said, oh no. <laughs> so I had to go back and buy a very similar color that was less reflective to solve the problem. And then it was perfect. It was exactly what I wanted. So having had that experience, things happen. It's like making a cake. You've got the same recipe, but you got different results because of different humidity or something. With color, things happen too. So, you know, I'll come out and we'll figure out how to tweak it if something happened. But in general, they they come out right or I couldn't keep doing what I'm doing. Well, I want to add my thanks. Um, I found this very illuminating and it's making me think um, that I should bite the bullet and think about painting my house. That's <laughs> <laughs> I've had the same thought. So, uh, so yeah, because all your houses look beautiful, Linda. So. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. So thank you all very much. Um, we're going to be having a uh, presentation on November 15th, the Ghost of Capitol Hill. Um, but other than that, I will end it here. But that's oh, really fascinating. Thank you I so much. I just want to put in a plug for the House Expo that we're having because yes. it's sort of along the same lines. Uh, we're having a House Expo October 29th in the Eastern Market North Hall. We're going to have about 30 different home service providers painters, uh, electricians, solar power, and representatives of district agencies, including DCRA and uh, Department of Energy and the Environment. All the details are on our website. Great. Thank you so much. And uh, we look forward to seeing you all. And uh, hopefully, again, Linda as well. So thank you. Have a great evening. Bye-bye.